This is Giuseppe Maggiore, and welcome to the lecture on arrays and the heap memory. Now, sometimes the variable ty the, the types and the variables that we've met so far, in their ability to only contain a single value, like a single integer, a single string, etc., are not enough because sometimes we need to store multiple values inside the same variable. Just like introducing loops expanded our ability to represent a sort of uh, flexible logic where we sort of extend the length of the program dynamically, the length of the program being the number of instructions that the program runs before terminating, so arrays expand dynamically our ability to store information when the domain of the information we need to store requires this dynamism. So, a series of values, all of the same types, can be stored in an array. And we refer to all of these values with a single variable. Okay, so, The general syntax of arrays is quite simple. We have the type of all the values that we want to store, followed by square brackets. This is a very old syntax. It comes from uh, the, 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 the golden age of C sharp, uh, of uh, C and C++, pardon, or may maybe even earlier at least. That, that's when I saw it first. So we're talking about literally decades, 30, 40 years at least and perhaps, again, even older. So if you're wondering, okay, this looks weird. Yes, it does. It's something from when people were still experimenting with programming language features and also experimenting a lot with their syntax. But anyway, uh, so we have a, a, an array of type. It's the type of the single elements, the square brackets, the name of the variable that we want to assign the whole array to. And then we can initialize the array by putting the new operator. You will see this is a keyword, it gets highlighted in another color. Then between square, then, then the type that we're constructing, which is the array type. And then between curly brackets, we can put value one, value two, etc. It is also possible to simply declare an array with a fixed size. For example, 10, then we allocate the space for 10 values, but their default value is used depending on the type. So for, for integers might be zero, for strings might be null, and so on. Okay, let's, uh, let's play with this. Let's define a series of numbers. Um, int, well, I don't know, the Fibonacci sequence at least a little bit of the Fibonacci sequence. New int and square brackets. And then here, one, one, two, three, five, eight, and 13. There you go. Or we could have some sentence, uh, uh, some, some words. Well, now new, again, a string array. And then between the curly brackets, we can say the get uh, is uh, on uh, the table. And there we go. Now, arrays can't really change their length. So if an array is created with a length of, let's say, five, it will always contain that number of elements. There is no way to uh, increase or decrease the length of an array. The only way is to actually create a new array and move all the elements over. And indeed, this is, this is reflected by the fact that the, the proper way, the traditional way to initialize an array would be to simply specify the length. Now, arrays are one of the most optimized data structures for storing uh, uh, more than one value. 
So they do lose a lot of flexibility with respect to a lot of the data structures we find in modern libraries, but they more than make up for it in performance because of the most CPU friendly, you could say assembly optimized accent, uh, access operators. So uh, this lack of flexibility is something that indeed will be off-putting in the beginning, but remember that arrays um, together with value types can be exploited in order to write programs in C Sharp, which have a performance that might come quite close to the performance of C and C++. But that's, that's for later. Okay, how can we use arrays? We have three essential operations on arrays. We can read values, write values, and check the length of the array, because if we want to well find out how many uh, values there are, we, we need the length. Okay, so let's start with the lookup. If we want to get, let me start the watcher. Yes, if we want to get, let's say, the first element of um, the words array. Actually, first let me show you what happens if I, if I were to try to print the, the whole array. Okay, what we get is, uh, oh, right, line. Okay, we get system.string array. We don't, we don't get all the elements. Hmm, okay. Now, if I want to get a single element, I can put the square brackets and the index of the element starting from zero. And we get the. Why zero and not one? Hmm. Well, because this is a legacy from, uh, uh, well, the world of C and C++, and its heritage is picked up by C Sharp. It would make sense to denote elements starting from one, which would be quite intuitive. Uh, but, point is that an array, the way it looks like in memory, let's take this, this Fibonacci array. It will actually, okay, so the, the variable Fibonacci, Let's, let's look at memory, okay? The memory of the program is partitioned in, in two. We have the stack, and we have the heap. Now, the heap memory is really a huge block of bytes. So it's just a, a, a mega array of bytes. So the heap, you could say, you could see it as, yeah, okay, you can look up by byte. So you could say, okay, that, um, the first variable that we have is uh, say that we, this this is our whole program, okay? Uh, so we only have uh, one variable in the heap, which is the array. So location zero at byte zero started the numbers. So at byte zero, uh, or well, byte word. So words are blocks of four or eight bytes, depending on the CPU architecture. But we have value one. So bytes, uh, well, let's say bytes 0 to, zero to 3. Then bytes uh, uh, 4 to 7, we have again value 1. Uh, bytes uh, 8 to 11, uh, 2. I'm very bad with, uh, with, with arithmetics, uh, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm a bit worried I'm going to make a fool of myself, but you know, for science, uh, I'm going to risk making a fool of myself. That is life. By it's 16 to 19, um, the value is 5, and, and so on, okay? All right. Okay. And on the stack, well, on the stack we have the Fibonacci, the Fibonacci variable. Well, actually, also the stack has uh, a series of frames, uh, but you know, on top of the of the stack, we only have one frame. And Fibonacci. Well, what is Fibonacci? Fibonacci is is what we call a reference. Uh, well, it also contains the length, and well, the length is also probably in in the heap. So we're we're going to have to think about where to put the length. But so Fibonacci will contain a reference to the beginning of the array. So I'm going to call it a reference zero, but actually this is just a number. That's why arrays are so insanely fast. So if I want to pass you 
an array to or 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 copy the content of the Fibonacci variable into another variable. I'm not really copying all of the array, I'm just copying the reference, and the reference is literally just a number which points to the address in the heap memory where the array begins. Now, uh, well, the array also contains the length, and the length has to be stored somewhere, so either uh, the either here we have uh, the reference and the length, because the length doesn't really change, so ref and seven or ref zero seven or we can simply say that uh, no we shift every everything uh, uh, forward by one and the first block is the length which is seven okay might look confusing and indeed it absolutely is if you try to work with uh, with pointers and memory offsets etc which is something that c sharp allows uh, so know that in case you ever need to hit the highest possible performance parameters, it is possible by using arrays and memory spans, which spans, which well are a low level uh, memory management mechanism in C sharp, and then yeah you will simply remember where things are, and uh, yeah, you can make whatever mistakes you want in in C and C plus plus. It was very easy to make uh, memory mistakes by trying to read something from the wrong location. Anyway, when you want to get so if if we know that the array is uh, reference zero, okay, and we know that the first four bytes is the length of the array, then we know that well, you know at byte zero this this zero here marks the beginning of the memory area of the array okay and we know that okay at that address so zero plus four starts the first element and the second element starts at zero plus four okay so this 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 starts this one here starts at ref zero plus four because the plus four we have already, that we always have. That's that's the the length bit that that we skip. Then this one starts at ref zero plus four, like always. Plus well four because we we skip the first element. Okay. The next one starts at ref zero plus four plus four times two because we have to skip two elements. And this starts at ref zero plus four. Skip the length and skip three elements. So this would be four plus twelve sixteen, which makes sense because this starts at sixteen. So actually the formula is skip the length plus four plus skip as many elements as um, there are before you. And what do you know? This value here happens to be the index of the element. So what arrays really do for us and to you in 2023, 4, 30, whatever, you might think, oh my god, really? But to the people who were used to doing a pointer arithmetic to writing this code manually, because when you had a pointer in C and C++, this is what you always had to do manually, and oh boy, the errors were everywhere. Now, all of a sudden, arrays were doing this for you, and making sure that you wouldn't constantly shoot yourself in the foot with a bazooka. And uh, yeah, that, that that's fantastic. Arrays are super useful. But they are also insanely powerful, because this little bit of arithmetics is supported directly by CPU, uh, by CPU instructions. So this thing is so common, so important, that there are CPU instructions that can do a lookup with an offset, with a, with a dynamic offset. OK, anyway. So now, if we run this program, what happens is uh, that we get the value 1 printed. OK, very good. So let's print uh, the fifth. Sorry. Ha ha ha. Not the fifth. The sixth, because 0 is the first. Now we get 8. OK, very good. The sixth would be the last one. In order to get to the last one, we could say Fibonacci dot length minus 1 because that is the last one, and we still get a value. What if we wanted to try to get 
Fibonacci dot length. What's going to happen? Boom! An unhandled exception. Now, because these arrays are, are checked, are validated against abuse, if you try to read something outside the length of, uh, outside the range of the array, you will get an exception. This means before zero or after length minus one. It's simply not allowed. You get an error. The program stops and crashes. This is quite bad. So uh, there are languages that are very lenient with this. Uh, uh, languages like JavaScript are really designed with leniency in mind. So they really try to continue. They really try to um, allow the program to sort of, you know, hobble on. Okay, there is a mistake, but maybe maybe the next function will not need this value. C Sharp is, in some sense, a stricter language. It's a bit more enterprise -y, if you could you could even say and as such it doesn't forgive this kind of mistake it doesn't forgive this kind of uh, this kind of error and the program will just crash so if there are instructions after instruction 10 they will not be executed the program will just stop completely there is a very cool feature uh, that allows us to look up values from the back of the array. <laughs> so we could say that we want the last element and this is with the uh, with the little hat uh, symbol. So uh, this is the uh, so this is basically th this basically means Fibonacci dot length minus and then minus one that's the last element minus two that's the element before and so on. Writing elements leverages the very first uh, syntax. So we can have the lookup of an element and then we say I want to put I don't know a uh, hundred thousand in it. And if we run this, well now there's a hundred thousand. This can be uh, the normal syntax or it can be the um, uh, reverse syntax, but yeah, whatever. You will get the same result. Arrays also have a very exciting feature, namely, and this is something quite recently that C Sharp has added, and this is a big change with respect to the, to the origin of arrays, which was really put all these elements next to each other in memory. Don't allow any crazy operations like shortening or lengthening because that would wreak havoc on, on memory structure. And, and so arrays have always been this super simple, uh, no nonsense, no frills, only uh, high performance data structure. But in recent times, C Sharp has also added this very neat utility to make a copy of an array by using a, uh, a range. So I could say, uh, uh, I could create some Fibonacci's, uh, or yeah, okay, some Fibonacci, and I could say this is Fibonacci, and then between square brackets, I could say the values uh, in the range one, two, three. Let's, uh, let's actually look at this with the debugger. That's um, it's probably going to be a little bit easier. So dear debugger, let's start. And okay, you can see that here Fibonacci um, is uh, these values. You can also see that they are marked by index. Okay, very good. No, why is it uh, not showing anything more more interesting? Okay, that's a pity. Uh, and then you can see that in some Fibonacci we have the values in the range from uh, okay the second value which which is there. Okay, so this is one. Then this is index two, and the one with index three is skipped. So it's uh, from this index to this index excluded. So fr from included to excluded. It means that you can make a, you can create a copy of the whole array by saying from zero to Fibonacci dot length without having to remember the minus one. No, it's a uh, it's, it, it makes sense. 
On the other hand, on the other hand, if you were to do this, what is going to happen? So let's say that we change the last value on some Fibonacci of one, and we put uh, uh, just just some number. What happens? Now, if you just look at the debugger, the debugger is not very helpful in this because the debugger is simply saying, okay, these two values both have uh, these two arrays, well, it's just two arrays, okay, and they contain these values. And the debugger isn't really showing us any difference between the two scenarios. So you might be led to think. That like any other variable, if you assign, oh, pardon, no, this, this is not going to be very misleading because the values are actually different. So zero to Fibonacci dot length. Ah, again, apologies. No, I don't want to start a dictation. Um, okay, so. <laughs> After having performed this hard copy of the values, well, this thing, they, they look absolutely the same. But there is a secret. And this secret is the key to understanding how arrays really work. When we make a copy like this, we perform what is called a shallow copy. So even though it looks like the two arrays contain the same values, truth is that both variables, Fibonacci and some Fibonacci, actually refer to the same array in heap memory. So the scenario we've just produced is the following. Fibonacci and some Fibonacci, they both point to ref0. So what, what this means is that if we change the last element of some Fibonacci, let's put the first because uh, I don't have it in my in my in my example here in the heap. If we change element zero of some Fibonacci, we have changed changed this element in the heap, and because both Fibonacci and some Fibonacci refer to the same entry in the heap, what we get printed. will be 1337. So it looks like Fibonacci and some Fibonacci are somehow uh, quantum coupled, you know, one changes and the other changes at the speed of light. But any other variable, like if we do this with an integer, we actually get a full code. If, if Fibonacci and some Fibonacci were just numbers or strings, well, when, when you assign the variable, you make a copy and the two copies are independent. So then if you work on one, the, the other stays put. So this is a massive, inconsistence in the language. Well, if you don't know the difference between reference types, these are reference types, so they are passed around by reference, and moving reference is also performing uh, this copy here, because it just copies a reference, the reference is tiny. This copy is a deep copy, it creates a new array with a copy of the values. So this is slower, but you get two independent arrays. So now, if we modify some Fibonacci, well, then the original array is unchanged because the situation we have is that some Fibonacci now is stored somewhere else. So let me think, it's a seven values uh, plus the length, so eight values times four, that's 32. So this will start, I guess, at 32. And so we have 32 to 30. 5, then 36 to 39, um, and in the, the, this is Fibonacci, Fibonacci is unchanged, so this is still 1. Here, on the other hand, we have 1337, because it has been uh, modified, and, and so on. Um, and then, then you have, you know, all these, uh, all these values are just uh, by offset. So you can see that some Fibonacci 
has resulted in this case in the full copy. And now if you change uh, a value in the heap under Fibonacci, it is not reflected under some Fibonacci and vice versa. If you change it in some Fibonacci, it will not be reflected in Fibonacci. Now, when it comes to arrays, because arrays are so-called mutable reference types, so it means that you can change them, and it means that you can share the reference. You can have multiple variables with the same reference. And this can lead to some very clever constructions, and it can also lead to some very, very nasty bugs when you have a part of your program that doesn't change an array, but there is another part of the program that changes that array because they share the reference, and all of a sudden you get things that expect, you get, you build your code expecting no change, but in practice you do get a change, and yeah, uh, the results will be uh, unpredictable, and uh, most certainly lead to strange situations, and I have seen this in practice. Um, okay, so we can... Um, also, we can nest arrays. So it is possible to put arrays within a... Oh, no, before, before we look into that, before we look into that. Of course, we have the length. So it is possible to iterate through, uh, through the array. Now that we've seen the introduction to arrays, let's, uh, let's, well, see the basics of how to work with them. Okay, so we can say for i is zero to Fibonacci.length in increments by one and then uh, print Fibonacci of i. And this would be the very classical way to iterate through all the elements of an array and just yeah, do, something with, uh, with, do something with them. We could also print the elements uh, backward. Uh, <laughs> there are two ways of doing this. One is to uh, do the backward, uh, the backward lookup. I'm not saying this is I'm not saying this is a good idea to be honest, uh, but it's possible. Or uh, we can say start at uh, length minus one, stop when you're under zero, and every time decrement by one. This would be a little bit more uh, commonly commonly found. Now forward iteration. So this sort of iteration is so common, it happens so often, that C Sharp has a shortcut integrated in the language itself, a special kind of loop called for each. With for each, we don't have access to the index of the elements, but only the elements themselves directly. And if you look at this, it's clear that, well, what we're really doing is we're getting the current element, and, well, in, in the body of the in the body of the loop, we're only using the current element, we're never using the, the index anymore. So the index is only used once to get the current element inside the body, and then that's it. If this is the case, then you can use for each. And with for each, well, let me show you. Actually, let me write for each underneath. So for each var current element, you have to actually give a name to the current element uh, that uh, we are using for the iteration, and then we can simply perform whatever computation we wanted. So if you, we only want to process the elements, but independently of their position, like say we want to, I don't know, find the biggest element, or uh, print all the elements, or add all the elements together, or perform an average, etc. We don't really care about the position of the elements, we just need to see them all and do something with each element. And that's when the for each uh, comes into place. For each, we'll create a temporary data structure, which is a data structure, uh, an iterator that has to track uh, the current position in the iteration, and this might be a little bit slower than normal for loops. So it might be that if you run, that if you work in a very high performance context, you might notice that other people are preferring for to for each. But for all normal, uh, let's say, line of business applications where crazy performance is not relevant, then you will usually encounter for each because it's less error prone and there is one less variable with a name we don't really care about, like i, j, l, or whatever, that we have to worry about. So less variables means uh, less cognitive load, less cognitive load, 
uh, simply means um, uh, simply means less bugs. Let's look back at uh, the template for the declaration of arrays. The type definition when introducing a new variable of array type is this type and then square brackets. What can we put into type? Well, actually, we can put whatever we want, including the type of an array itself. So, this means that it is possible to have an array where the single elements are arrays. The opportunities to represent this concept of a data structure with multiple elements, where each element in its turn contains multiple elements, is something we refer to as nesting and is exceptionally powerful. Nested arrays can be used to define, uh, well, very often a sort of spatial representations. For example, a geographical grid to subdivide uh, the subdivide space in 3D cells to define a prioritized queue where the first element will be processed before the others, etc. So we can represent sequences, we can represent uh, spatial configurations, we can represent whatever we want. And well, this shouldn't be underestimated because um, a lot of our understanding of reality is spatial. And so the ability to more or less map this, so for example, the fact that uh, you have uh, element i, and that, uh, that represents, I don't know, the, the row, uh, and element j nested represents the, the column. Well, then, then you know that uh, i plus 1 and j plus 1 is, is, is a neighbor. It's literally a close element, and so on. Now, for example, we could have um, we could have a checkerboard, which could be an array of arrays of booleans, and well, this would be an array of arrays. Now we have to specify the size. So let's say it's a it's an eight by eight checkerboard, and um, for every element, now we could say that checkerboard of zero is a new well, is a new array of eight booleans. Checkerboard of one, and so on. Of course, we can also initialize an array, a nested array. So we can put the initialization code right after the declaration which refers to the first array of arrays. And now we can specify the single values. So a uh, new bool of eight. Here we could also have then further the initialization. Uh, so let's say true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. And uh, let me see. Well, we don't need to specify the eight actually. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, pretty good. Uh, then we have the alternating elements. So let's take the head, the, the the tail, and put it in the head. And now we repeat this twice, and this would be a reasonable checkerboard. Okay, let's print this thing. Now, four. Um, so. We could say that indeed uh, we start iterating by row, so checkerboard dot length, and these are the rows, and then every row has a series of columns. I don't know why Visual Studio Code constantly decides that I really want to indent with tabs, and uh, the tab is long too. I don't like it. I want tab. I want spaces, and I want to not four. Okay, then let's iterate the columns. And how many columns do we have? Well, that depends on the single array. In this specific case, the checkerboard is really a square. But, well, it's not written anywhere that the single arrays have to have the same length. So for each array, we actually have to check the length of that array. And what is the length of that array? Well, first we pick the array, which is checkerboard of row. And because this is an array, here we can, uh, we can get the length. Now, 
on, well, not right line actually, but just right. Now we pick the checkerboard at the current row, at the current column, because checkerboard of row is an array, so we can perform a further lookup. If this is true, we put an asterisk, otherwise, we put a space at the end of the whole row we can actually print a right line in order to show the the end of the line so the lines are neatly arranged one after each other let's oh no 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 no, no. this is not how i want it on the next to each other yes uh, dot net run and we get this well sort of checkerboard it uh, it it looks uh, it looks decent okay uh, there is quite a lot of repetition in this code so even in the initialization we might want to um, to do this a little bit better so let's um, because well this is a very regular pattern so there is there is no reason to um, there is no reason not to calculate it. That's what computers are good at, you know, Calcul calculating uh, uh, more or less regular things. Now, when we initialize the array without values, because remember, the array has a fixed length, then, well, we have to specify the initial size. Okay. Then, for every row, now the rows are, uh, are, are empty at this point, but we have to initialize them. So uh, for every row, so checkerboard dot length. Now checkerboard of row. This is an empty array. We will run the, through this with the debugger uh, to see what it uh, what it actually looks like. Uh, we have to initialize it, and well, this element here is an array of booleans, and so let's initialize it with eight booleans. Now. We are going to write basically the same logic of the for the consumption of the array. So for each column. So checkerboard of row dot length. And well, we might be tempted to just write eight, but let's not, because there's a chance that the length of the array might change eventually. So by making our code parameterized, we keep it more flexible, we reduce the number of, uh, of, of potential errors that this code might end up containing uh, later on. So, you know. Then we can initialize checkerboard of row of column with, well in this case we check that uh, even rows uh, have the uh, are, are full on even columns and odd rows are full on odd columns. So row modulus two says whether or not the row is, uh, is, is even or odd. Column modulus two also says the same and by checking for equality, well, we should get to the desired result, which we do. Okay, let me run the debugger now. Let's take a look at what is actually happening under the hood. Okay, in the beginning the array is null, there is nothing in it. If we try to access the array before it's initialized, we just get a we just get an error. Well, uh, in in this case, if we try to access the array when it's uh, one of these arrays when it's null, we get just get a null reference exception because uh, well, null is not an array. So if you try to look up an element, uh, things are just going to to blow up. The program is literally just going to stop. We go through the items now. Row uh, through the rows. The row is zero. Checkerboard of row in our case is null and now it's going to be initialized and what we do get is seven nulls and one array of eight booleans the booleans are all false why are they all false well because false if you remember is the the zero representation of boolean so every every type has a default value and this default value is basically the 
equivalent of having all zero bits. So for example, the, the checkerboard itself is a reference, so its default value is null. And what is null? Yeah, literally all bits to zero. So when a reference is uh, uh, refers to, to, to the memory address zero, which is always occupied by something else like operating system or, or other control structures, not for programs, then we assume, yeah, okay, then, 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 it, mean, then it means nothing. Um, and boolean zero is false literally false is represented as a, as a, as a zero as a zero bit or a zero byte uh, in general okay now uh, so we have these eight booleans notice that the array is being constructed so if someone were to accidentally try to access checkerboard of uh, one of zero then the program would crash at this point because that value is simply not available and then we start initializing the values uh, one after the other so now the checkerboard contains a true value let's uh, do this and go through this a bit quicker so the second the checkerboard is initialized now is is allocated and after the for loop it will properly be initialized then checkerboard of two is now allocated and now it's initialized allocated initialized allocated initialized and so on until they are all allocated now Obviously, at some point, it really depends on the application that you're implementing and its specific requirements for representing data. But um, nested arrays can and sometimes will even be jagged, meaning that the lengths of the subarrays will be different. So, for example, I could define a triangle where the single elements of the array. Uh, one of these uh, one of these mathematical triangles that sometimes you see in uh, mathematical books or uh, you could have uh, like uh, the Fibonacci triangle or the, what's, what's it called the Fibonacci or geometric triangle I don't remember where every item is the sum of uh, uh, the two top items uh, from from the previous row this this kind of thing that's why the length of these arrays it's quite important because, uh, well, in a in a jagged array, in a nested array, which can also be which is also sometimes referred to as jagged array because the, the length of the single subarrays can vary in in all sorts of ways. So it could even look like uh, like the the, the 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 teeth of a hand saw. You know, some are longer, some are shorter, longer, shorter, and uh, perhaps not even that regular. So you do need the length in order to know how uh, how much to process. And then, of course, we could easily go through this by saying, OK, for each row in triangle. Notice that I'm using the for each now because I don't really care much about the index, which is quite common when uh, when dealing with arrays to simply say, no, I, I, I don't. I don't care uh, that for each column I don't care about where, where this item is so for each column in row and then here we can say okay console dot right just the right actually uh, and then let's put just a column with a space and here we put console dot right line because we want to signal the end of the row and then we get well the print that we have oh yeah i leave hello world because if i comment the rest otherwise there will be um, there will be a complaint from the compiler but let me show you just just so you know why uh, so if you if you do this then there will be a complaint that there is no main anywhere so that's why sometimes this this console the trade line sticks around okay Sometimes, though, the difference in the sub-arrays, in the nested arrays, is actually something we just don't want. Imagine that you're representing a, a grid, and the grid really needs to be full. So every column has to be exactly as... Uh, every row has to be exactly uh, the same length, has to have the same number of columns uh, as the rest. So there's a special type of array, which is the so-called multidimensional array. And the syntax is slightly different. So we can declare such an array with a comma. 
So this is not an array of arrays, but it is rather an array with a given two-dimensional size that is uniform. So I could say array 2D would be int and then, for example, 10 and 3. And this is an array of 10 and 3 elements. So, uh, or in a well, well, the triangle would be a very bad, uh, a very bad candidate for this, uh, because it was really meant not to be a grid. And now I can access the single elements. For example, I can say uh, I get element zero zero, and I can assign it to well zero. Uh, well, we we can go through we can go through all the elements. Um, one by one. So for example, let's say that I want to initialize this uh, this array. But first, let's take a look at the array. First, let's take a look at the array. What it, uh, what it contains, how it is structured, and how the debugger represents it. Now, so this uh, to the array, you can see it's all the elements. And it's basically treated as just one big array where where we have first all the elements where the first index the row is zero so you see zero 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 but then the columns zero one two then we have all the elements for which the row is one and then the column zero one two and so on and we have n rows and three columns so every time there's only three columns for every row okay I don't know exactly how this is implemented um, under under the under the hood, but I do suspect also, given the representation, that indeed a two D array is just a big array because you can represent an array of uh, uh, ten and three with a single array of thirty, and you just have to be careful that if you want to have a row and a column, well, then if I want to have a row five and column one, I have to pick row 5 times 3, so that would be element number 16. Uh, that's, that's also a trick that some people use sometimes when they have to implement this, but it's not available in the language, for example, because not all languages do have this very handy shorthand notation. But the shorthand notation is basically just a, just a single array. Anyway, we can... Um, uh, we can get the, the, the length of the different dimensions. So, for example, we could initialize this, uh, but one might say, okay, but how many rows are there? Well, array 2D dot get length for dimension zero. Now, this is not ideal um, because you can also ask the length for dimension 20, which doesn't exist, which, which will crash. So these are some of those things that you just have to be careful about, uh, never to do it. So you have to know how many dimensions you have and uh, stick to it. Uh, let's see if we can actually see the number of dimensions. I think it's the rank. Well, let's actually take a look. I'm wondering if it is the rank. So it's a very good candidate. So at least you know what to, what to dynamically check. Uh, let's uh, take a step uh, and let's take a look at the array 2D. Does it actually show the properties? No, it does not. Uh, but array 2D dot rank. Was it with a capital R? Oh yes, true. Yes, indeed. Which which is the number of dimensions? That's uh, that, that's quite commonly used as a word in computer science. The rank to denote the number of dimensions. Okay. So at least if you're wondering, uh, okay, what is the maximum value I can put in uh, in get length? That would be rank minus one. And then uh, let's initialize our array. Let's say array to the of uh, uh, row and column is equal to um, row times column. So, a sort of little mathematical puzzle. But again, you could have, uh, imagine that you literally have um, a building and you have the floors 
and every floor has rooms and the rooms are the, are the enumerated in an array and every room actually has some data that you want to store that would be a perfect candidate for a nested array for example uh, but imagine you have a, a city grid literally the, the grid of a city and you want to know how many people live in every uh, in, in every one of these blocks so you consider the, the city to be basically a, this uniform a checkerboard and then well there you go that, that, that requires um, a multi-dimensional array like this one because your, your life is actually simplified by the fact that, that there is a, um, a uniform number of columns in each row and so on okay now let's take a look at this array again what it, uh, what it looks like in the debugger and now we can see well the first row is zero then we have one shoe uh, sorry zero one shoe then uh, uh, 0 2 4, 0 3 6, 0 4 8, 0 5 10, etc. So it's a sort of a multiplication table. Okay, well, again, nothing very special. If we do 10, 10, 10 and 10, this, this will actually be the multiplication table. And you know what? Let's print it. As usual, console.write line at the end of the row and then console.write then let's create a nicely interpolated string with um, array 2d of row column and then indeed a space to look a little bit nicer let's restart the watcher let's run the project and well that oh yeah <laughs> perhaps we shouldn't start at zero but we should start uh, at least not the computations uh but perhaps we should start them at at one no, because the the first row and the first column aren't really carrying a lot of information anyway okay let's see if uh, one tab is enough to make this look a little bit cleaner yeah, then the, the tab is, uh, is 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 enough, but it's also it's also a little bit too much. Uh, you know what? That's uh, that's uh, fair enough. If we wanted to do this really properly, uh, we should convert to string and then pad the string with zeros to the left. But uh, that is uh, by far and large way too much work for this. I want to go back now to uh, to our triangle because this array 2D we've just seen uh, before we do that before we do that um, so how is this how is this array uh, how is this array organized let's let's say that the array were uh, a little bit shorter so we have a, a, um, a four and three so these are twelve elements now the way this is going to look in memory we said is that we are going to we're going to find well actually let's do it properly so on the stack there will be uh, on top on top of the stack there will be uh, a stack frame well there are many so there could be functions so that's why I'm representing this uh, also as an array because the stack is also a sort of a, a, a variable length array where you can push elements on top and then here we have the variable array 2d which has a reference let's call it a reference uh, reference something reference uh, three maybe there are also others in our program so this points into the heap and the heap is this big area of memory which is organized just by by memory addresses so for example at memory address 3 there is the whole array that we allocated for our array 2d actually remember we also said that there is some extra data so in the case of the array 2d a little bit more extra information is stored for the rank which is two so that's the first uh, four or eight bytes would be the rank just uh, how how big is uh, 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 how many dimensions do we have then we have the two lengths which are four and three because if, if we're able to retrieve them then they must be stored somewhere and then the actual elements start and the elements that start are i'm going to mark them as well zero zero uh, because well that would be row zero and column one zero one zero two zero th no and that's it because it's uh, only three elements then one zero one 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 two two zero 
two one two two three zero three one three two okay very good so uh, what if we want to access let's say element two so so where is element two two now so we have three columns for every row so element two two, two will be at row times length of one plus column which means well the row is row two times three why because well we have to skip the first row and the second row so that would be six elements that makes sense because the, fir the, the first two the two rows we have to skip um, they both contain three elements and then well plus two so two times three that would be six elements we skip because those are the previous row, rows plus two and uh, well that's the, the the number of elements we have to skip and you see we skipped uh, well the right number of elements <laughs> And you can actually use this trick again for uh, having your own organization system to treat a single array as a multidimensional array. And in some cases, I've, I've done this plenty of times in the past when, uh, when, when doing video games, because uh, an array of arrays, like our triangle, and now we want to go back to the triangle, might be scattered in memory. And this might even have... Uh, uh, slightly negative performance consequences for the garbage collector but uh, even more for the cache coherence accessing the elements of an array one after each other is very 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 fast because the cache of your CPU when you fetch an element of an array because it's so common to fetch single elements of arrays uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a row that when you fetch one it will prefetch from memory the next elements so that they are already there while you're processing the first one and this is a very special thing that is also very 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 fast and very important for performance okay when you're dealing with very high performance applications uh, but in the case of for example a nested array well the representation of this in memory is actually um, well okay in this case we're all all, we're, we're allocating the, the array literally in one go but if there were other programs with um, with other threads running at the same time these arrays might not end up after each other in memory breaking a little bit this cache coherence mechanism uh, the cache coherency we call it so how close things are in memory that are used together uh, in the program that is uh, that is that is cache coherence uh, and in this case well we have the stack in the stack on the top frame we have the triangle and a triangle is ref, uh, ref, ref of something well uh, let's let's say ref zero even though a reference is never really zero in practice because uh, address zero is is always reserved and we use it for null but anyway uh, ref zero we mean the first active reference in our heap and then we have uh, here ref zero or if you want just zero and at ref zero well we have the length so we do need the length which is um, four of the first array and then uh, well what is the first value well the first value is a uh, ref uh, something else so in our case these are eight bytes so let's say this is ref eight oh no it's uh, it's more because no 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 okay let's say it's a uh, ref 20 uh, ref uh, 30 so because all the subarrays they are, they are scattered in memory so they are they are something else and they, they are somewhere else and well there is no guarantee that they will be created uh, they, they will be created in the same place then at uh, well, there's probably more stuff around but then there's ref 20 which is the first subarray this one the one containing one okay this has a length of one so we also need to represent the length uh, and well then there's value one that's the actual value in the array and at ref 30 
what do we have? Well, we have a length of 2, and the values are uh, 2 and 2, and so on. So you can see this, this thing is quite scattered, and if you want to access uh, element uh, uh, 0, 0, then first start with a triangle, uh, accessing arrays and uh, working with uh, with with um, with understanding the memory model simply means that you understand all of these little jumps. You know, you're somewhere you have some information in your context and you jump. So you start with a triangle and you want to get element zero zero. So you go to the reference zero. Okay, that's uh, looking at the at the row. Uh, sorry, look. Well, no, that's actually the triangle. Then oh, you get to ref twenty. That's the row. And then you jump here and you get column zero, and that is the value that you can return. So there's quite a lot of jumping around, so that's why indeed these um, multi dimensional arrays that we saw before, the ones with the comma, they actually have a value. They are fast, they are faster, at, um, they are faster at least. Okay, we Top this lesson off with something a bit special that I wanted to show you, where we can actually see the direct consequence of um, of um, of the way arrays are represented in memory, connected with function closures. Okay, now let's begin. Let's say that we have a variable. Mm. And let's say that this variable contains an array. And let's say that the array contains, yes, uh, let's say again, 10 values. I'm relying on the fact that they are all going to be initialized with, um, with a value of 10. Let's, let's call this the cache. Okay, let's say that we have a function from int to int that performs a little calculation. And let's say that this calculation is is, is slow uh, in, in the parameter. So the parameter is uh, the parameter is x and uh, we return okay we return x plus one. Of course x plus one is, is not a slow computation, but imagine that the computation might be slow, or maybe it's even an asynchronous computation that requires talking to a server, etc. You don't want to run this computation uh, too many times. So how do we do this? Well, we could say... Um, oh, why is it unhappy? Oh, because I'm not returning anything. Yes, let's say that we get the... We calculate the result first. Oh, but apologies. Okay, first we check into the cache. If the cache for this input is zero, then we get the result. We store the result in the cache for the input, and then we return the result. Otherwise, we just return cache of x. Now, this program as it is written has a lot of issues, namely that function f cannot deal with the, uh, with, uh, with, uh, well, has only 10 elements of cache. The cache should really be big enough to store all the possible inputs. Maybe it should even be a dictionary, etc. We will see this later on. But what I really want you to see is that now, well, what we have just created what we have just created here is um, a combination of closures and mutable references which can be used with very interesting effects but also very uh, unpredictable effects if you don't know exactly what is happening. Okay, because now, of course, the cache has been defined in this scope function f is going to be used in this scope, so let's say uh, console.writeLine f of uh, uh, 10, console.writeLine f of 11, and then console.writeLine f of 10, oh well, now let's make the cache a little bit bigger than, uh, than just 10, okay, let's run this code, let's see what happens first, 
and then we'll talk about how we store the memory and also and also change a little bit the way it's produced. Okay, so first we are inside f. Inside f we have two local variables. And that's interesting because the cache variable is stored outside and yet we have it here. And this is the, the so-called closure. Then, well, because the closure is shared between the scopes, it exists beyond just this iteration of the function. So for now, uh, the cache contains 11 at position 10. This is the pre-computed value. Then we calculate f11. Notice that the cache has not changed because, well, it's not a fresh variable, it's, uh, it just sticks around. And now we have another element in the cache. Okay, very good. And finally, here we skip this very heavy computation. Look at this, look at this. And bam, there you go, because the cache already contained the value. Okay, very good. But what if we want to have multiple functions with a cache? So what if we want to have a... Uh, um, another function that performs another computation, let's say x times 2, and I want to now cache this operation, this other very heavy operation. Okay, now one thing we could do is we could say, okay, you know what, let's, um, because now we cannot re reuse the same cache, and we also don't want to have a separate cache variable, because this, this gets very ugly and very unmaintainable pretty, pretty quickly. So, Let's uh, let's make this construction scoped. Now this is the function add one cached. So you know what? Let's uh, just define it like this: int add one cached and add one cached will just uh, produce an instance of our function by declaring the cache as a temporary variable cre and creating or, or actually you know what just returning this lambda in one go oh what a disappointment why is it unhappy ah <laughs> no of course it doesn't let, let me see yes okay so <laughs> What I said is that add one cached returns a function of int int and takes as input well nothing. Actually, I'm going to make this take something as input because add one cached takes as input a parameter which is the size of the cache. So that we can also make this parameterize instead of just saying a hundred. No, no, just a, we we can specify it so we can create uh, and and then. And then we get the function from int to int. It's this function that performs the calculation, but with um, but with the cache intact. But but with the cache uh, uh, of of the desired the size. Okay. Then we can copy this mechanism and say, okay, this is uh, times two cached. And, well, this we have to initialize to the size of the cache. And uh, what's it unhappy about? Oh, yes, of course. Well, we don't even need to, to declare this. We can just return it in one go. Okay. Then I can also say, and I can have multiple caches, therefore, I can say that uh, f is add one cache with a cache of size 100, but I could even say that I have uh, f2, uh, which has a separate cache. And of course, I can also have var g, which has which comes from times two cached with a cache of a thousand, so a thousand elements that we want to be able to cache. Okay. Now let's see how much the compiler actually tells us about what is really happening. Uh, what is really happening in here? And let me also see if I can use the debugger while the watcher is running. Let's hope we can. Yes, we can. Okay, so well, this is going to be interesting. We enter into add one cached. Here, in this scope, well, there is a cache. But there is no cache variable here, which makes sense, 
because in the main scope, well, there is no cache variable. Okay, here we have this cache with 100 elements, size of cache, okay, look, size of cache, that's a variable, this is a proper local variable, and then, well, we just return this function, okay? So this function here, but this function has a reference to cache, and cache, together with size of cache, belongs to a stack frame that will be destroyed. Hmm, interesting. So, let's see, what is in F? Let's actually see how much we get to see. Oh, look at this. Uh, inside the function, there is a target object which contains what we call the closure. All the variables that were defined in, at, in one of the parent scopes when the function was declared and also defined, all those values are saved into, are copied over into this target object. They are copied over, before, and so the cache has been copied over, but because the cache is a reference type, well, only the reference has been copied over. So this object here has remained in the heap, and now the function f maintains a reference to it. And this target object contains everything that the function used that was defined when the uh, around the body of the function or that sorry all the things that were defined outside the body of the function that the function itself also uh, needs to use so basically this function that we return takes as input one parameter x implicitly sort of has a constant value that's the cache and because the cache is stored in the heap then whenever f makes a change to the cache well it's always the same cache here in the target but we don't get to see it and now if we enter here well a new cache is allocated and function f2 now also has its own target, and this cache, well, it's another one, you can see it's a... Uh, um, oh, this is very cool, yes, of course I want it, I do, I do want to, I do want to see memory. Oh, look, and this, this is the heap memory, oh, so beautiful, yes, 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 okay, very exciting. Uh, and now you can see that indeed uh, F has its own cache with 100 values, uh, and F2 has another cache with 200 values. You can carry in the target of a function a lot of data. And then it's very important to know how the copy of that data was made when the value was, we say, captured in the closure. Is it a reference type? Then you're only copying the reference. But if it's an integer, well, then you're copying the integer. And then if that integer is changed, well, the change will not be as uh, shared and global as the change to an array. And now you can see, one of the things I really wanted to see with this is that even though we are at the beginning, and I do understand this is a very complicated example, these things in the language, they have these very rich and complicated interplays and exchanges of functionality that are governed by, yeah, by some pretty serious rules, and so it's very nice to actually start diving into them. As always, thank you very much for being here, thank you very much for listening, um, take your time, enjoy, it's going to be a long and fulfilling journey. And see you next time. Bye bye.